So in that respect, you can see the uh, polarities. Our focus is always directed in a certain, certain way. Sometimes it's focused on self, and the next moment it's focused on the world outside. You know, the mind is fluid in general. As you experienced watching a tree, your mind will, the mind, if there's such a thing, the mind wanted to be fluid. It was your, your head, your, your consciousness, so the, the controlling part of yourself saying, I should be focused, I should feel this way, I should not feel that way. But the spontaneous natural movement of the mind uh, is, is, is not bound by and restrict, restricted by your, your uh, uh, self-expectation or dogmatic thinking. So focus can be self, self-focused or task-focused. When the mind flows back and forth, that's that's a sort of a natural and healthy condition. Um, when the next door neighbor is having a renovation, <laughs> it's very annoying. And you know, you say, oh, it's so noisy, I cannot concentrate. And if, when you start reading an interesting book or a newspaper article, that goes into the background, it doesn't bother you. Especially if, if, workers, were, if workers are making a lot of noise for your renovation. <laughs> Their noises don't bother you so much as next door neighbor's renovation. So there's a subjective element. Uh, we're also motivated by anxiety to avoid certain things, but also we have the desire side. So in, in the last uh, uh, big nose exercise, you are motivated or you want to get to know each other. That desire to know each other, desire to find something in common with other people uh, pulled you forward. The uh, embarrassment or uh, uh, self-shame around the big nose was pulling you back, but the desire to move forward guided you forward. Therapists would say, well, if you're anxious, you have to control anxiety, you have to feel good about yourself, let's raise your self-esteem first, etc. There are a number of roadblocks placed by the therapist or by the therapy itself. The Mauritian approach is say, well, just not cut through them, just walk around those anxieties and then go to the next step, and that is the desire. In spite of the anxiety, in spite of the, uh, um, say, thoughts and feelings around the big nose, you can engage in action. And the action in that case was to, to talk and also to be visually focused on on your partner or on the other persons. Idealistic expectation is one side, but that needs to be balanced with more realistic expectation and practical thinking. What cannot be changed, what cannot be controlled, may have to be left as they are. Instead, we can choose our action, because action is a lot easier to choose and modify. Self-control can be directed in that respect either in an affective direction or a behavioral direction. And you know, sometimes we say, be happy. Well, can you make yourself happy? It takes you quite a while to feel happy. The moment you feel happy because of this uh, active self-imaging or whatever, you lose it, you've lost it. The, mo the moment you said, now I've achieved happiness, so the desirable condition, it's gone. So it's, you're back to the starting point. Um, the skilled liver, the person who lives a life, a skilled liver in that respect can let things go much more easily. I think you used to say, Paul, um, cross-cultural counselors, or counselors in cross-cultural settings make mistakes and skilled, effective counselors recover more quickly from the errors the neophytes. Neophytes stumble over their own mistakes and then they become preoccupied and forget to kind of focus back on the client. Uh, so making mistakes is one thing, but recovering from errors by focusing back on the task at hand is another. I think I always credit. If you're not making mistakes, then you're not taking enough chances. That's right. And acknowledging the mistake makes a lot easier. Yeah, that's right. But it's interesting how our materials for learning are often, you know, people 
provides the best case, the miracle case, right. you know, and yeah. sort of the perfect, in the perfect situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's right. So Morita, in a way, take place, uh, uh, offers the uh, coping model. You know, we talk about anxious person, and I don't know how many of you would regard yourselves as anxious individuals. You might say situational anxious. Like I, I developed the uh, um, second language anxiety. When I first came here, I had to learn the language and express myself. And I was a fairly non-anxious person back in my home country. But when I had to speak the language, I suddenly became extremely self-conscious uh, to the point of you know not being able to speak. And that's the kind of anxiety associated with the second language or cross-cultural kind of uh, performance. Um, and that seeing someone who's f feeling anxious and still speaking, or still engaged in the desirable action, was a much better model for me to follow than someone who had overcome all the anxieties and speaking fluently, wonderfully, that's a very high ideal goal. If I compare myself to that person, I would be very small. My effort, my effort to be a better speaker was non-existent. But if I see myself as someone who feels anxious about the second language and a new culture and still speaking with you know, a shaky voice and, uh, and you know, making mistakes here and there, uh, it was comforting that I was making a bit of progress. Um, so in that respect, the coping model is Comparison, yeah. yeah. Social comparison is a, probably the innate aspect of our social nature that we always compare you know, for better or for worse. And that excessive social comparison becomes uh, critical. Like in Japan uh, and in some other uh, Asian cultures, uh, children develop self consciousness, public self consciousness, with anxiety when parents say, well, look what other people might be thinking of you. And if you misbehave, people will be laughing at you. So there's always the, the self being the object of others' perusal. And that generates a very strong public self-consciousness. Uh, private self-consciousness is another concept, um, which means you, you become self-aware without comparing yourself to others or putting yourself as the object of others' evaluation. So, Mm -hmm. And I would rather be accepting of myself than critical of myself. Right. But in marine therapists, would say, hey, those can occur at any time, and you Yeah, there are, there are times you become self critical, but then you can be self critical and then dwell on it, but do nothing action wise. The self criticism could have something concrete and practical. Say, you know, uh, you made a mistake in a public presentation. You introduced a speaker, you made a big error, and, you know, use the wrong term or something, or for a while you, you're down self-critical, but then your focus can be directed from the self-criticism to what did I do wrong? How could I improve myself? How can I practice and improve myself, improve my presentation skills? Then your focus is back on task. And in that respect, you can use self, or the negative instant that generates self-criticism as a starting point to move forward betterment, improvement of skills, for example. So temporary self-focus and temporary self-criticism may be necessary or just unavoidable, and yet where to go from there. Some people say, well, I made a big mistake. No more public presentation. Don't ever ask me to introduce guests, and etc." They take sort of a uh, stance. Um, so in a Adlerian perspective, it's a sort of a life position. I'm a lousy speaker, a lousy whatever, and then they just cut, shut themselves away from the uh, future possibilities. Uh, of course, let's not forget the more therapy was originally developed to help people who are so-called shinkeisu, who tend to have characteristics such as being self-preoccupied and extremely sensitive and uh, uh, you know, hypersensitive to physical discomfort, 
stomach turning or shaky, uh, dry throat, shaky knees, etc. Uh, the, the tendency to be self uh, critical and perfectionistic in expectations. So, uh, Shinkei type patients or so clients tend to have excessively strong tendencies to be self focused and motivated by anxiety, controlled by anxiety, and they ap apply idealistic, perfectionistic expectations, then they end up being self-critical. They try, the sol they think the solution to their problems, behavioral problems and other problems, is learn how to self-control, how to uh, eliminate anxiety as well. And then they also engage in intellectual was engaged in self-talk, and I don't know how he is as a person, but um, he intellectualized so much that he doesn't even know the sun is shining outside, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then there's an avoidance of def defense, and risking an immersion, as you, as you said, Paul, brings up new opportunities, and there's always uncertainties around doing something new or facing a new experience, and yet sometimes risking is worth it. Um, then focus on the need of self. Like, what do I need? I want to feel safe. Then I, I want to feel secure. That means I should turn down invitations to speak or whatever. Uh, the self-focused, self-serving needs, uh, need fulfillment, often take them away from new opportunities. Sometimes we need to address our own needs, and it's important too. But at the same time, we have to kind of Balance. What about needs of the situation? If you are social anxious, you don't want to yell out. And that if your child is having a, a say, a physical problem, and you need to call out the doctor, but you're too embarrassed, what do you do? Be quiet and hope that someone will notice that your child is suffering, or yell out, "Help! I need, I need a doctor. I need someone to help this, help my child." Be embarrassed about it, but then you have the choice between these two. So that's the kind of balance we want to restore. Um, it's not that you should be always task focused. It's dangerous if you're entirely task focused um, and totally immersed in the experience. You could be a, a very effective murderer, you know, as an example. On the other hand, if you're excessively self reflective, and there's no action to follow. So the extremes are problematic, because you get fixated on one, one type of living, one, one type of being. But what's important is to have that flexibility and fluidity between the two. You can feel, reflect, and also take action. You can, you can acknowledge your desire to feel safe, or, or not wanting not to face the uncertainties, but also you might give yourself a chance to try something new. So the exp uh, more therapy is a very experience generating, experiential and non-intellectual approach in that respect. Theory is intellectual, but uh, we do not promote talking and intellectualizing in this approach, because those clients who are suited for more therapy do uh, over-intellectualize and over-engage in self-reflection. So, more therapy tries to create a balance by focusing on the other side, externalizing the attention. Uh, so that I will talk a little bit more about the, exper the uh, uh, residential approach that characterizes the Morikian principles very effectively. Let's take a break. When you come back, I've asked Cynthia to read a story that I wrote. Um, uh, it's, it's a story that depicts some of the Morikian uh, principles. So shall we take a 10 minute break? When you come back, we'll start off with the uh, story. Thank you. Sure. So, for example, anxiety. We experience anxiety in many different ways. One is the physical, uh, anxiety around physical existence, fear of death, fear of illness. We put on a coat or 
carry an umbrella when it's rainy because we don't want to catch a cold, we don't have a pneumonia, and type, other types of um, um, problems. We want to feel comfortable. We don't want to feel cold and chilly, etc. Um, anxiety and fears exist almost as a part of the human existence. Now, we also have anxieties around interpersonal existence, so social anxiety. The fear of rejection, fear of making a fool of yourself in front of others, fear of being disliked, fear of not respected by others. We also have uh, more personal existential type anxieties, like fear of not finding meaning in life, fear of um, losing or not succeeding in your career, fear of not achieving personal goals before, before death. Some are more spiritually oriented anxieties, like fear of not being connected with God for some people, or fear of being alone or being abandoned, not only socially, but abandoned by God or some great force. Now, these are, this column is a bunch of fears and anxieties. In Morita, we look at the other side. We consider fear and desire as two sides of the same coin. Where there is a fear, there's a desire. The fear of death is paired with the desire for life. Fear of illness, desire for health, right? Fear of uh, social anxiety, social desires. So fear of being rejected, fear of social failure, fear of being disliked are accompanied by a desire to be liked, desire to be socially successful, desire to have friends, desire to be appreciated. So and looking at existential, spiritual, and personal aspects, uh, fear of not finding a job, desire to find a job, a fear of not finding meaning in life, desire to find meaning. So in that respect, are fears and anxieties that abnormal, that unacceptable? Or can we embrace both fears and desires? That fears are inevitable part, inevitable reflection of the desire. Desire to live means we want to desire to live fully and hopefully in a meaningful and uh, uh, harmonious way with others, harmonious with others, and nature. So in that respect, here I'm normalizing and, and looking at taking a more naturalistic perspective for, uh, on anxiety experiences. That where there is a fear, there's a, uh, where there's an anxiety or fear, there's also a desire. You can act on the fear by saying, oh, I'm so, I'm so scared of going out because it's thundering or, or it's, it's cold outside. Oh, I'm so scared of going to this uh, social gathering because I don't want to feel put on the spot. I don't want to make, a, make social blunder. Or I can act on desire, my desire to, to connect with people, as you said, a desire to be liked by others, desire to meet people, uh, desire to engage in a lively conversation and get inspired. So you could act on the fear and avoid the situation or act on the desire and fearfully, anxiously, you go, you go to the place and socialize. Um, then we have what I call perfectionistic adverbs or killer adverbs. Like, don't, don't parents sometimes say to the kids, I want to do this uh, uh, chore willing, willingly. If the, I want to underline those uh, adverbs or adverbial phrases. I want to do it happily. Okay, I can do it. I don't have to feel happy about it. But if parents or whoever makes a demand on you said, I want you to feel motivated to do it. Or, or fine, don't do it if, if, you, if you can't do it willingly. What happens if willing is an emotional fluid part and doing is the action part. So engaging in action is easier. The child can say, oh, okay, I'll do it. 
I'm unwilling, but I'll do it. And as a child gets into your, the chore, whether it's cleaning dishes or washing the floor, the child gets into it on, you know, they get into this uh, meditative, meditative state. And, they, and one, once they are done with the chore, they're happy or say, oh, I've accomplished it. So feelings come and go. But if you impose the, uh, a certain affect, like I want to be motivated, I want to feel excited, you are putting an ex very difficult demand on the person. The person could say, well, if I can't feel motivated, what's wrong with me? Or, well, I don't have to do it because I don't feel motivated. Then you become, uh, uh, the child becomes very mood governed. So, desire part, back, back on the sphere desire as two sides of the same coin, Monitor focuses on people's energy on the desire part. If you want to go to the meeting, what can you do? What, what you're nervous about, you know, speaking to strangers, that's a fear, that's accepted. But fearful if you were to do it, what would you like to do? Well, or to, to go to the uh, uh, gathering, what do you need to do now? Well, I have to pick up the phone and let the person know I'm coming, and then prepare whatever. So the person can engage in action fearfully with anxiety. So severing the, the, uh, severing the anxiety part is like severing the other half of the same coin. It's impossible. Where there's a fear, there's a desire. You can't simply have a desire and be fully motivated with no anxiety. So uh, that's, that's the part I want to focus on. I call it uh, uh, conversion, anxiety, desire, conversion exercise. And sometimes teaching, teaching counseling clients about the, the legitimacy of fears, normality of fears and anxieties as human emotions, as human properties, is very important. If the counselor or the therapist said, let's, let's work together to defeat anxiety, then you may be putting a big roadblock, undefeatable. Just point out very briefly about shifting gears. There are some elements, and I thought about these seven elements about the uh, common Buddhistic ideas. <clears throat> One is meaning. Sometimes anxiety or other so-called inconvenient feelings have no meaning, but it's up to us to find meaning. Anxiety itself is a, it's an emotion or the label that we give to a, a set of a syndrome of uh, affective, cognitive, and even behavioral reactions. But I'm anxious, and what's the meaning? I'm anxious because I want to, I'm afraid of being, uh, being seen incompetent by others or making blunders in, in public places, but I want to present my ideas. Then there's meaning in persevering with anxiety because my desire pulls me forward. My anxiety puts a break on, on me, but I, in spite of the anxiety, I will move forward. So in that respect, uh, there's meaning in suffering. It's not that suffering is good, it should be always generated, but if it happens, let's, let's get the best out of it. That's a sort of Buddhistic idea. Second is acceptance. Things are not always, uh, do not always conform to your expectations how people should be, how I should be, how the world should be, is not always the reality. Can we accept it? Can we accept our imperfections, if you might call, or fallibility of human nature? We are prone to anxiety, we are prone to self-criticism. It's all normal parts of, of human existence. Gratitude. Gratitude requires our awareness to be released from self-absorption. To be thankful, you have to be aware. Uh, and we live in balance, in balance with other people. And while you, while you demand things from parents, etc., at the same time, we can shift here and say, well, I appreciate that. Well, what have I done to deserve this? Or how, when someone is kind to me, can I, am I too busy thinking of myself to acknowledge that person's kindness. Uh, or say, you know, sometimes 
parents stay up all night looking after you when you're feverish or when you're sick. And then parents have to get up or, or go to work the next morning in spite of the fatigue and the lack of sleep. When have we taken the chance to thank our parents? So gratitude requires the ability to place your own personal needs aside and then look at what other, others have done. So that's, it's a form of maturity. Um, impermanence, things don't stay the way they are all the time. One moment I'm really anxious, I think I'll just go nuts, and the next moment it changes. Same with happiness. At the height of happiness, people say, I want this to go on forever. The only option is to commit suicide so that you can die happily at the height of happiness. Otherwise, it comes down. Same with youth, youthful kind of, you know, uh, vibrance or joyfulness may decline with aging, but other types of joy and happiness uh, uh, emerge in life. Compassion, feelings for others. Sometimes the big nose that we talked about, we, we have, what's the big nose for you that's symbolically? What is the hang up, so to speak? And there are other people who also have nervous problems or, or shyness or things that are, that are not always visible from outside. They are coping and also they may be suffering. How can I be helpful to other people who are equally shy or even shyer than me to, to, to join a discussion? And when you pay attention to others suffering, without reducing, uh, reducing the value or the, the, uh, the intensity of your, of your own suffering, you can develop compassion and, and give a balance. Um, transformation. The transformation is how can you, if, if, if you think that, say, your nervous personality or introverted tendency is a gift and it's up to you to make the best out of it, how could you transform it? And the next story that Cynthia is going to read will give an example of that. Like how can you make the best out of what you have? There's a book many years ago, I ain't much, but I'm all I've got. Do you yeah. remember that? In 1970s, early 1970s. Uh, transcendence, and that's sort of a, I don't mean to be entirely transcended in a spiritual sense, but going beyond the ego or self-consciousness. Me, let me give you one quick example, doing the dishes. You experience self-transcendence, ego transcendence. Almost every time you do the dishes, you would say, I don't want to do the dishes, or who left so much, so much food on the plate? You know, the mind is busy, thinking, complaining. You're not really into the action of doing the dishes, but it's like a wave. When you, for a moment, you say, oh, the dishes are done, or you totally forget about those things. Zen and the art of doing the dishes. Get into it. So these are some features without becoming religious or um, overly spiritual, right? most therapy does have spiritual elements because it gives us the balance. And it's not always me, 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 my feelings, etc. Clients suffering abuse and other types or, or very intense emotions, you know, they can just, uh, they need to be helped and, and their pains need to be recognized. Sometimes they need to go through the some time of reflecting and getting in touch with feelings, working on feelings before they take action. So I recognize that. But then what can they, what can they do after that? In doing the um, um, trauma and abuse therapy, for example, John Breer talks about two phases of uh, treatment. One is stabilization. The other one is exploration. Exploration of a traumatic event is very upsetting. Sometimes they dissociate or they just kind of, you know, go into the very painful experience and forget about here and now. Stabilization is a therapeutic intervention to bring the person back. You know, Mary, what's your name? Where are you? How old are you? Bring the person back to the present. Be more present focused. And that's a balance too. Sometimes clients, you know, get immersed in the past or certain painful experience as if, as if it was happening here and now. And that's part of the exploration of trauma and abu abusive experience. But more therapy is a good way to bring the person back to the present here and now, or give sort of a ground 
what do you need to do, what can you do. When you go home, uh, you have to shopping, with, where's your shopping list? Bring the person, kind of, give the person a concrete list of things that they can do for pragmatic reasons and purposes. So these are some of the aspects, and then I would like to invite Cynthia to read the story. Could you come to the front? Okay. called Shaky Joe and Thunder Master. There lived an unhappy man named Joe in a small distant village on the mountainside. He was a skilled carpenter, but he was very ashamed of his fear of thunder and lightning. People called him Shaky Joe because his knees shook his teeth chattered, and his heart throbbed like boiling water. Thunderstorms often visited this village every summer. People, except for Joe, were used to them. But Joe was so scared that he hid under the bed, trembling in fear. He used to say to himself, this is it, the end of my life. I'll be hit by lightning. His vivid imagination of being burnt to death was no help. A big man like me shouldn't be nervous and scared. Look at my shaking knees and throbbing heart. My teeth are chattering like the lid of a boiling pot. I wish I could be free from all these so that I could live like a normal man. When a thunderstorm came, the villagers used to say, Shaky Joe is hiding under the bed again. Well, we won't see him for the next couple of days until he gets back to normal. Don't expect to get your order finished. One day, Shaky Joe was told that a thunderstorm was coming. As he heard this news, his knees started shaking, teeth chattering, and heart throbbing. The more he tried to stop them, the worse they got. Joe had been under his bed already when he heard a thunderbolt above his head. Flash! Crack! This is it! I'll be dead, he thought. Surprise! said the unknown source of the voice. My goodness! Look at this red-faced little creature standing by the bed with thundering drums. Joe immediately knew that this was Thundermaster from the legend that the villagers often told their children. Thundermaster said, I've been looking all over for you. He continued, I want to place an order. We are having a party next week up in the mountain. We need three brand new oak chairs, just like the ones you made last summer for the village festival. I need them in six days, starting today. But oh, I'm a nervous wreck. I can't get back to work after such a terrible anxiety attack. It's impossible, replied Shaky Joe in a weak, trembling voice. Thundermaster said, sorry. But you are the chosen one. I will have to take your life away if you don't complete the order. Joe knew that Thundermaster really meant it. But I'll get you anything you want for a reward. After thinking a while, Joe nervously said, I want new parts of my body, a pair of knees that won't shake, a set of teeth that won't chatter, and a quiet heart that won't throb. Very well. 
I'll check on your progress every day. With a great flash of light and earth-shattering thunder, Thundermaster vanished. Joe could not sleep that night. He was scared of what had happened to him that day. Next day, Shaky Joe heard a thunderstorm from a distance. As usual, he felt the shaking of his knees, the chattering of his teeth, and the throbbing of his heart. He hid under the bed and trembled. Under the bed, Joe was feeling sad. He wondered if he could get anything done in his life at this rate because of the fear. Soon, Thundermaster was in Joe's room. Joe, how is my order of chairs coming along? Joe replied, sorry, sir, but I'm so scared and such a nervous wreck that I can't get to work. Thundermaster repeated three times, complete the order or you'll be dead. Then he vanished. This is serious business, Joe said to himself. On the third day, another thunderstorm came. Shaky Joe had to deal with Thundermaster's threat again. There were only three days left. While his legs were shaking, Teeth chattering and heart throbbing, Joe took his carpentry tools and oak wood pieces to show Thundermaster that he was trying, although Joe had no hope of completing the order in three days. Joe hoped that Thunder would have pity on him and spare his life. He trembled under the bed in fear as usual. Joe held a plane in one hand and a piece of oak in the other, as his arm shook, the plane touched the wood and it rhythmically started carving the wood into the shape of a leg of a chair. Joe felt, aha, this may work. In half an hour, Joe finished one of the legs. Then he saw Thundermaster looking under his bed, smiling at him. Thundermaster said to him, I'm happy to know that you are taking me seriously. You've got three more days. Good luck. And then he vanished. Joe crawled out from underneath the bed with the finished leg of the chair in his hand. He still felt shaky and nervous, but strangely, he also felt pleased with himself. It was a strange sense of accomplishment that he had never felt before. I didn't know I could work even when I was shaking. This was a big surprise to him. He worked on the chairs for the rest of the day. By sunset, his arms were quite tired, and he had a good night's sleep after supper. Next morning, on the fourth day, Joe gathered all the tools and wooden materials for the ordered chairs around the bed. He was well prepared for another thunderstorm. By then, he had finished half the work. Here it comes, Joe uttered as he heard thunder and lightning. He felt nervous and scared. His heart throbbed, his teeth chattered, and his knees shook. Joe crawled underneath the bed with his tools and materials. He has to raise the bed so he can stand up and assemble the pieces. <laughs> now, here, he had a little workshop. Joe's knees shook. Teeth chattered and heart throbbed, but Joe was also busy working on the order. Flash! Crack! Here came Thundermaster again, but there was no response. Joe was so immersed in his work that he hadn't even noticed that Thundermaster was there. Thundermaster just smiled and quietly vanished. The same thing happened on the fifth day. The last day finally came, along with another thunderstorm. Joe had worked all morning and the chairs were almost completely finished. All he had to do were minor adjustments and, and sanding. As he heard another thunderstorm coming near, he felt nervous and scared as usual. Joe said to himself, okay, time to get to work. I have only half an hour left. 
He worked hard and forgot everything else, everything underneath the raised bed. Joe heard some noise and stepped out of his converted workshop. Flash! Crack! There appeared Thundermaster. Joe pointed to the three beautifully finished chairs. Thundermaster said, very well done. Thank you. Your life will be spared. As a reward, you asked for a new pair of knees that won't shake, a new set of teeth that won't shatter, and a quiet heart that won't throb. Here they are. Joe said, no thanks. I don't need them any longer. What else would you like for a reward then? Joe replied, Thundermaster, you have already given me a reward. I learned how to work even when thunder and lightning is frightening me. When I shake, I just find a plane and work on a piece of wood. You taught me a lesson. After all, I like my knees and teeth and heart. These are precious gifts from my parents. I'll live with them and take good care of them. Thundermaster quietly smiled at Joe and then vanished. Afterwards, Joe felt at peace with himself for the first time in his life. He wasn't ashamed of himself any longer. He was comfortable with his shaky knees, chattering teeth and throbbing heart. He said to himself, now I can work and shake at the same time. Since then, thunder and lightning never stopped Joe's work. His business prospered. He became a well-respected craftsman, highly reputed for his fine workmanship and reliable work habits. Ever since, whenever a thunderstorm visited the village, Joe smiled warmly and remembered the visits of Thundermaster. At this point, I would like to have a short uh, process, process check session, and I'll ask you to break into groups of three and just talk about what you have learned, what you have found interesting um, from any part of this uh, workshop up until now. Afterwards, you come back and then get, get a few uh, sample responses from you, and uh, then I'll talk about uh, clinical applications of mirth therapy especially in the context of the general counseling practice. Give some examples, pointers, and then uh, uh, open up for uh, any questions and answers and uh, any sharing of your thoughts. So could you spend the next five minutes talking about your thoughts? Um, <laughs>
I can make a connection between the uh, auto hypnosis or so, auto suggestion and the uh, monitor approach in two different ways. Um, first of all, we don't say, if you did this, you will, you will feel relaxed. We would say, if you did this, you will become more aware of what needs to be done or what's there. Or you will focus on the muscles. You know, the, the sports training, for example, always focuses on physical sensations rather than affective things. It's not like generating the self-confidence that's sort of abstract. We would say, well, if you practice, you know, starting or placing, placing your feet in this way and shifting your weight this way or that way, and then, you know, you do some kind of self-instruction, then you can push yourself faster, forward, more forcefully, etc. Instructions tend to be more physically focused, activity focused. So we would say, if you did that, you can see things more clearly or whatever. But not, not to say, if you, if you did this relaxation exercise, you will feel better, more comfortable. So we don't do that. Another thing is, the, uh, as part of the uh, oral suggestion or kind of a Ericksonian hypnosis, we, I say to my clients, when next time you face anxiety, you will remember this session. You will remember these three things. Say hello to anxiety, then focus on your desire, and take action. Then that becomes the, uh, uh, the self-instructional uh, uh, suggestion. The client will say, oh, okay, I can choose to be anxious and do nothing, or choose to take action and be anxious at the same time. The, the counselor said, um, accept it, say hello to anxiety, it's part of life. And then he also said that, uh, uh, look at the desire, what's my desire, what do I want to see happen? Or can I go on in my life like this without ever taking any action every time I'm faced with anxiety? Or should I just take action, risk, risk taking action? So that's the kind of uh, auto suggestion that I tend to use. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's the uh, um, solution focus people would use. Like, do you have any experience? Have you had any experience of being anxious and still doing what you wanted to do? Yeah, what are the past successes? Yeah. Please. I'm impressed by the method you're using at least to what these several hours of this workshop where you say, do this, and then you tell me what happens. Mm -hmm. Rather than do this and this will happen. You say, no. go through this experience and then get in groups of three and explain you tell me, I don't know what I'm going to tell you. Thank you. Please. Yes, uh, in Japan, many of my colleagues uh, who are psychiatrists combine morita, sort of gentle, soft 
softer version of morita with antidepressant. And often depression is uh, uh, physiologically and chemically based, so we have to address the, uh, the physical side through medication. And at the same time, you help clients, depre depressed clients recognize that they still have things they could do. They can't necessarily engage in big actions, but they can still, you know, uh, write letters or send cards to see what they can do. Be how can they be creative or use their time creatively while feeling depressed? What are the additional things? But don't say you, you shouldn't feel depressed, or if you did this, you will feel less depressed because it's, it's the trap that they experience. And when you say, well, you've got to go beyond depression through action, they become even more depressed saying, how come I can't do it? Sounds like other patients can do it. I can't do it. I just can't shake my depression off. So, you know, the therapist needs to be extremely uh, empathic and you know, compassionate with the depressed clients suffering from physiological grips as well as the uh, emotional grips. Right. That's right. So in in a way, you develop skills and, and maturity or wisdom to ride on the flow of life. And in that case, the, the mood swing is part of the flow of life. When you're down, you know there are things you could do, but not too much. When you're up, feeling better, then you, there are more things. Um, Morita, for example, was a sickly person uh, in the latter part of his life, and often he was in bed while he was running the uh, residential treatment center, and uh, uh, his, his patients were dealing with this, this kind of Shinkase-type problems, and he would say, when I'm sick, only this much, I'll stay up and write and then just lie down he wrote a lot, a lot of books and articles. When he got, he had some options. When he had fever and had to lie down, he will read books or he will have one of his patients read a story and then he will sleep. And then, you know, like he had prepared some optional activities based on how healthy or how, how sickly he was. So. So that's sort of practical and creative suffering. Yes, please. Can you remind me in that Shaky Joe and Thunder Master story? Why did Shaky Joe, why was he able to chip off the first bit? I mean, the first five minutes of his working was the most critical. That precipitous moment, yeah. Well, he was shaking, and then he, he was holding a piece of wood, and he had a chisel in his hand or plane. So he just realized while he was shaking, these two things were making contact, and he realized. So his, he, his thinking shifted to the more creative one by saying, oh, I can shake and shake and work at the same time. So that's, in a way, it was just a, an accidental discovery that he could do that. Yeah. But, yeah. I feel like I'm a shaky joke because what happened is I did not do it in my lawyer's papers for ICBC for a year and a half. I had a time for four days sitting here listening, and I know that if I don't learn anything, by Monday I'll be more guilty than I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. from today is uh, you can do it, you know, so maybe I get the lawyer said, but I think you said that Buddhist is a meaning, 
talking to you, you know, this would blow up a few thousand dollars and you just buy some garbage and they would set the case. But I, I'm so perfectionist, I don't know what to do with that person. Mm -hmm. So I'm checking the meeting. But I still don't know what, what, what would initiate my first man conversation. Right. Yeah, one one option is to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure that many of you are pro at you know addressing these things. Many of you are very productive, and also many of you probably are perfectionistic. So you probably have your own success stories. But one is to, to put the pen on a piece of paper and see what happens, or put your fingers on the keyboard and see what happens. In other words. And engage in the action. Yeah. 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 Because writing a perfect letter in the first round is very difficult. Please. Yeah. Uh, some more therapists try to change the world or convert everyone into Mauritius. Or Mauritians, and my approach is to help uh, Western counselors, psychologists, and psychotherapists to appreciate the value of it without becoming a more therapist. And in a small way, you can apply more therapy in your own practice. If, if, if any of these things make sense to you, you can do it in a small way, a mini morita. It's like bits and pieces, you know, it's a little snack. You know, it's a piece, it's, 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 a, it's a, take a snack of Morita and see if it works. See if it works on you, see if it works on your clients. Any stories you want to share, like these stories, maybe helpful, even the big nose exercise, meditation. It's, Mm -hmm. of, of their studies. So in a non-therapeutic way. Right. Oh, it's very, very useful, very applicable. When you look at one of the handouts, um, I describe the um, um, Mauritian instructions. You might find any of these helpful. For example, this also summarizes what we have been discussing. Um, one is not judging affective conditions. Um, when you're sad, that's, that needs to be accepted as it is, rather than trying to deny it or, or devalue it, sadness, happiness, etc. And in a way, sharing your thoughts is very important. If you're a teacher, all the more it's important to be a good model for the clients. Um, you, know, you have to kind of decide whether, this, whether your sharing or self-disclosure has any educational merit or demerit, it's up to you. Often, you know, sharing humanness does not mean you're always in a positive mood or positive psychological condition. You, you know, in fact, we are most moved by people who share the darker side or the, or the more frail part of the uh, humanity, and sharing of that nature really has a positive impact rather than saying, you know, you have to be ambitious, be courageous, this way, that way, and that just uh, serves as sort of a negative cue for self-criticism. Well, you tell me to be courageous. Everyone seems to be courageous but me. What's wrong with me? So that perpetuates self-abnormalization. Uh, so these things that you find on the, um, uh, one of the handouts may be helpful to keep in mind. How can I use these in my role as a teacher or educator and fellow human being with my students? Yes? What are the Suicidal clients? Suicidal clients, I think, require extra care because Sometimes action is a mask of the deeper feelings, right? 
I'm talking about clients who tend to be over self-reflective or uh, hyper-reflective that needs to be balanced with focusing on others. Some clients, I think, the, the anxious clients, the uh, societal clients included, probably need to be helped not by simply focusing on action, but helping them recognize their desires, the pain of living, and then also what they wish to achieve. And they might look at small things they could do. Sometimes, and this is not societal, but people who are facing imminent death, like cancer patients, benefit from more therapy very much. And I'm, not, I'm shifting gears a little bit, but I might be able to respond to your question in an indirect, indirect way. There is an approach called MLP, MLT, or Meaningful Life Therapy. Meaningful Life Therapy is a Japanese approach developed based on the principles of Morita by an oncologist, Itami. And he's actually uh, brought his cancer patients to Mount Everest and Mount Fuji and all those things. They have those mountain climbing projects. Uh, these people facing and coping with the fear of death and uh, the, the difficulties uh, associated with the cancer and other types of uh, intractable disease uh, are encouraged to look at several things. One is first learn to accept and live with anxiety or fear of, fear of death. Second, um, take action that would make their lives meaningful. Some people say, I know I'm going to die, but everything I do on a daily basis can become part of a good memory that I can die, die with. So every day I take action that contributes to the cumulative, uh, accumulated memories. Uh, one of the things they do is called humor therapy, humor speech. And the group members of this uh, ML, MLT uh, are uh, given the assignment. That is, you pay attention to things around, around you in your life and find the material that you can make a humor speech out of. So that means that while you are suffering with your cancer or life-threatening illness, you're also paying attention to people, what people say and do, and you know, any interaction with others. They sometimes make fun of themselves. And, <clears throat> and they come back to the uh, weekly MLT meeting and share those stories. And the person who tells, who gets to tell a, a joke or the, a humorous story will be applauded by others. So you know, you get even, out in the middle of suffering, you can entertain people with sort of a human, um, humanly funny story. You know, some people talk about, you know, the uh, urinating in the wrong place, but then they, they had sort of a quick recovery by creating a great joke out of themselves. So, in a way, you can follow your suff suffering inside and being pulled back inside, this approach helps them pay attention to the world outside, stay in connection. You know why it's like object relations therapy in a, in a broader context. You can relate to the world outside, you're embraced by this big thing called nature or the universe, and then you're living your life fully to, till you die. And every day you live, uh, can be wasted or it can be used in a positive way. So they also engage in um, small activities like picking up garbage. And a group of them will go out to uh, uh, public areas like parks and streets. And you know, they wear gloves and all the uh, sanitary precautions and then uh, pick up garbage. That's because, not because they have to do some kind of big uh, um, social contribution. They just feel good to see less garbage on the street. And that contributes to their own well-being. It's not like, make me feel better. They'll do things that help others, and that makes them feel valuable to others, and also meaningful about life. Please. I wanted to comment on the suicide ideation, because I think it's 
because I work with patients who have suicide ideation every day in an emergency department. And um, what I'm hearing that, that sounds useful is the idea that you can have a symptom, even suicide ideation, without act, making a choice to act in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think is valuable is the idea that you have an abiding depression that's an illness, and rather than an expectation that you get rid of that depression or you're not, the expectation that when you live with chronic depression, just people who live with other chronic Yes, please. In uh, Japanese psychiatry, of course they do, and uh, in, because the majority of the more therapy practitioners in Japan are either psychiatric workers or psychiatrists, or working in the medical area, they end up using the uh, diagnosis. Like um, early on, I talked about different types of uh, uh, emotional problems using DSM. Uh, DSM-4, but uh, you know, they use terms like somatoform disorders, panic disorders, uh, phobic obsess obsessive disorders, or obsessive compulsive disorders. They use those, and actually, they also use uh, shinke shitsu, which is a, a neat way of describing themselves. They, instead of saying, I'm, uh, I'm phobic obsessive, or I'm, I'm clinically depressed, some people will say, um, I have the uh, shinkeshitsu personality. Rather than saying personality disorder, I have a shinkeshitsu trait. That means I tend to be prone to physical discomfort. I tend to be self-critical because I'm perfectionistic. I'm very overly introspective and introverted. And these things backfire on me. But how can I transform this quality of nervous trait into something positive? For example, you know, being a, a surgeon, you have to be perfectionistic. We don't want a surgeon who will say laissez-faire. Oh, okay, you know, one <laughs> stitch, two, two stitch. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, of course, it's a functional direction of perfectionism. And in that respect, uh, the Mauritian the uh, Shinkeitsu diagnosis or the or label helps normalize some of these things. It's not just simply social phobic or being um, obsessive and compulsive. It's, we're looking at the positive quality and, and, and being obsessed with imperfections is, uh, is in a way a positive quality as long as you live your life meaningfully. So if you become obsessed and perfectionistic and self-critical and avo avoidant in lifestyle, then you go in that direction. But you can, you can be perfectionistic. You may have to you know, turn the switch, the light switch on or off 10 times, 20 times in a ritualistic way. But then what can you do? Or well, give yourself a time limit. Like, OK, I'll allow myself to do turn, flicker the switch 10 times, but no more. Time out, time out. next thing I need to go point A from point B, etc. So they can learn to not not to eliminate all the symptoms, but just cope with the symptoms, but move on. And a new new action generates new experience, as you were saying. New experience also generates new insight and also give give an opportunity to to let physiological symptoms kind of uh, recede into the background rather than always talk, talking about symptoms. And that's what the, uh, the residential approach does in a very systematic way. And I don't have time to talk about the residential application, but uh, uh, one of the articles briefly mentions the, uh, the residential, the original residential method of morphotherapy. therapy. I really appreciate this uh, gentleman's uh, example. Uh, I question. 
which was what is the precipice for the kind of the change happened. And I heard you say that it was sort of by chance in a way or that was the circumstance. But I also believe that it kind of goes back to